Thank you so much, Sudan Lok, and thank you, the organizers, for inviting me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <coughs> I was here 10 years ago when I was doing my PhD, um, so it's extra nice to be here again. <laughs> I was on a, a leave for writing up the thesis, which was really good to be here in, in London doing that. Okay. So, um, I would like to start by uh, acknowledging my colleagues and friends and informants in Southeast Asia that I have been working with over the years. Uh, without them and their invaluable help, and uh, patience, I wouldn't have been able to do what I have been working with in Southeast Asia. I've primarily been working in, in Laos, uh, but with this last research project, I have expanded that geographical area to also include uh, the southern part of China, northern part of Vietnam, Thailand, and Myanmar uh, in that mountainous areas, part of Zomia. Um, so my, uh, this, who I want to acknowledge, also helped me to realize that the adventure is not to move from Europe to Southeast Asia to work, but it rather starts when going in the other direction, when I need to challenge my taken for granted preconceived notions about the things that I study. So for that, I'm especially um, appreciate them. Mm. Um, this presentation that I'm going to do today is part of a larger, it's a small part of a larger research project that I've been working on for the last four years. It's a, a research project funded by the Swedish Research Council. Uh, so I'm doing uh, the research at Uppsala University. Mm. And uh, the name, the title of that larger research project is Rooted and Routed Heritage Indigenous Cosmopolitans in Southeast Asia. And the overall aim with that project is to explore the concept of uh, indigeneity. Uh, since the word indigenous is seldom used in Southeast Asia. Um, and by using the concept of indigenous, because I should also add that I did my postdoc in Australia, so that's where my interest for indigeneity, the concept of indigeneity and indigenous heritage started. And uh, I was curious about this concept because, as I said, it's hardly ever used in Southeast Asian context. So by using that concept, I mean generally local groups or ethnic minorities, etc. Um, and it is a complex and questionable concept, since it always it is always a we who define the other. Also, when it comes to that we tell say that someone else is indigenous, it's most more often than the indigenous themselves telling uh, saying uh, claiming themselves being indigenous. So it's a power imbalance already from the beginning, which is uh, intriguous. Uh, anyway, um, it's, a, it's an internationally uh, used term uh, in the uh, academic field as well, in archaeology and art history and, and heritage study, studies, so that's why I want to dig a little bit deeper into it. Uh, geographically, this project starts, uh, departs from, from uh, the mountainous areas there. Uh, that you I intentionally left out the national borders because that's part of the idea with the project to try to see how the indigenous or the indigenous groups or minority groups in that area I'll just point it out here in this area primarily it's a large area and I have not covered all of it but I have done um, studies in uh, Guangxi province in China Nandan and Donglan uh, districts. Uh, they are quite close to the Vietnamese border and the northern part of Vietnam in Long, Long Ku. And then I've uh, gone further to the southwest to northern Laos and Luang Nam Tha province, 
over to Thailand to Mae Hong Son and into Myanmar to Kaya State. And <coughs> what is common for this area is that all these uh, ethnic groups living in that mountainous area use and produce bronze drums. And they do it still today. Because when earlier when I worked in this area, I got to know about the bronze drums more or less as, as art objects exhibited in museums and so on. But in fact, they are very much in use and produced in this area. So by looking at these uh, minority groups in relation to each other, the idea with the project, uh, research project in general is to see if, if the fact that they have a common shared heritage by using and producing the drums, um, maybe that could strengthen their cultural identities because these groups are often much oppressed and discriminated by the nation, national states that were in the, the states where they live. So I'm interested to look at, at these groups um, and how they use and produce and can be strengthened by this uh, shared heritage through the bronze drums. So, but that's the, the general aim of the research project. Uh, it's a big geographical area, it's a large scope and so on, but um, uh, I'm just going to present a little bit, just some illustrations to show that uh, it's a vast area uh, with the bronze drums. It's, I depart from a contemporary perspective uh, mainly in their research project, looking at the bronze drum production today and um, how it's used in tourist uh, contexts and how it's used in um, traditional authentic rituals and uh, how it's uh, used, how it's used as symbols for different things and uh, in museums as well. So. Um, What I want to focus on today then is the l two pictures that I showed in the last uh, slide to the left. Uh, it's an example of uh, how the bronze drums, bronze drum tradition is kind of re reinvented in a Buddhist uh, context in Vietnam. So what I want to focus on today is um, the position that the bronze drums have in an art production and ritual practices in Southeast Asia, illustrated by this example from Vietnam. And I will uh, specifically explore how the drums have been transformed by being part of and central to animist ritual practices to being included in Buddhism, and how this relates to art production and art history categorizations exhibitions and Buddhist ritual practices, which you can see examples of to the right. And then to conclude, I will try and connect this example to a, the larger scope of the entire research project again. So I start by uh, looking at giving you a history and background by looking at the local, what I call a local drum history. Uh, during my field work, uh, I came, I've been doing a lot of interviews and studies in museums and uh, among different organizations that are working with the ethnic groups in this area and with the bronze drums. And I've interviewed a lot of people um, that are still um, connected to the bronze drums because they use them and part of the minority groups. And doesn't really matter which country, national country they come from or where they live today, but they all have very much in common when it comes to their creation stories. Um, where they are originally come from, and uh, as you can see in the map, um, we have, they all end up telling stories about the Gobi Desert. The creation stories always, uh, without going into details about any specific creation story, I just try to um, conclude the impression of all the stories that we have been collected during the, the fieldwork, which are quite many. 
Um, but what they have in common is that they all seem to have originated in the Gobi Desert. The stories are about sand and water and storms and uh, people that have to move, migration to the south. Uh, many of the stories also include a part where they talk about bronze or metal gongs, this flat round instrument that they used to play in the Gobi Desert. They reached, it had a nice sound and it reached lar vast uh, distances. So they used it for uh, calling for when it was a war or uh, calling for the ancestors and etc. But then when they had to move and migrate uh, southwards, they came to the mountainous areas and then it was not enough with this, it was not a, a strong enough sound from that gong. So that's when they developed the sides of the gong so that it became a drum. Um, so, um, and most of the groups that uh, we have been working with date this to around 3,000, 2,500 years ago, approximately. They don't tell uh, specifically a date, but uh, the Karen, for example, in Myanmar and Thailand, they use uh, the, um, how do you call it, when we have uh, Anno Domini, they put it 738, 39 years before that, which is then 2000, almost 2,800 years ago. And that mark is marked by the, the fact that they started to uh, settle in that area from coming from the north. And they also use um, um, another concept to, to date, which is uh, they always talk about giants in their creation stories. And giants are also used in uh, different Western cultures in, uh, during the Roman Empire, for example. When they talk in the early written sources, they talk about things that happened approximately two, three thousand years ago. They talk about that was the time of the giants. So there are connections that you can draw also between other cultures that use the, 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 the concept of giants as a, as a way of placing something far back in time, approximately. They all end up approximately two, three thousand years ago. Um, so there are lots of uh, written sources from China and Vietnam primarily uh, that are from uh, um, between one and 1,500 years ago where they also talk about uh, bronze drums and there are ethnographic material. Uh, the ones who wrote, uh, have written and documented are not the ones who used bronze drums, but they are written about in early Chinese and Vietnamese um, written sources. Um, the first documented excavation of bronze drums is also documented in a Chinese written source, and it's dated to around 1,000 years ago. So this gives a totally different picture from what we, from this part of the world, think about the history of the bronze drum and the documentation of the bronze drums, usually. We have also the um, newly, um, the site in China, which is uh, was designated a World Heritage Site two years ago. Uh, where we have uh, uh, 2,400 years old uh, rock paintings uh, showing people with these famous well-known head dresses connected to the bronze drums and the motifs on the bronze drums. It's also depictions of bronze drums in the, in the, in the rock paintings. So there are a few sources that talk about these early kind of uses of bronze drums. And there are also uh, connections with the, or interpretations of the motifs uh, quite early on in the uh, literature and written material uh, about the why they have different sorts of animals, for example, in the depictions on the bronze drums. Mm. 
So this is quite different then from, from uh, well, to conclude the, the local kind of drum history, it's apparent that from the beginning it was a, a part of an animist ritual practice according to the motives and according to all the written sources and ethnographical material and so on. Um, <coughs> they used it for, uh, according to the ethnographic material, they used it for, for uh, calling the ancestors, they used it in different ceremonies such as uh, harvest, celebrating harvest time, celebrating all the different uh, times of the year that needs to be celebrated to celebrate weddings and uh, funerals and to, to uh, build a new house, etc. And that's approximately what they are still being used for in this, in this area. However, the international drum history then that I was more used to <coughs> <laughs> before doing research in, uh, with these um, minority groups, uh, it started in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries with travelers, missionaries and colonialists from Europe coming to uh, this area, uh, collecting drums or just documenting, seeing the drums, talking about the grum drums, rec uh, recording the drums. Um, in the early 20th century, Franz Heger was studying well, and how 165 bronze drums that were collected uh, in Europe uh, became the base for his categorization and typologization of the uh, bronze drum that is still valid today, which you can see in the middle there, Heger 1, 2, 3, and 4, and a lot of subgroups uh, and so on that I won't go into detail here. Um, <coughs> um, then the Dong Song concept or the Dong Song culture was kind of created as a concept uh, in the 20s and 30s when um, the French uh, working at the uh, AFO in Vietnam uh, were in Dong Son and uh, well it was actually not one working in Vietnam in uh, Hanoi, but it was a person who was stationed in Donson. I'm sure several of you know the details about this, but as I try to cover a lot of things, I won't go into detail into different things. So, so uh, I just mentioned this. But um, in the 30s, a Swedish archaeologist, Olof Janse, was excavating, and that was the first scientific, scientific excavation of a bronze drum, actually, in 32 or 34. And uh, in uh, connection to that, or just before that, this uh, concept of the Dongson culture was, was then established. Um, so, um, no, let's see. I have um, listed here the different ways that the drums have been studied as art objects and as archaeological artifacts and as technological innovation because what, what one of the aims with trying to find the origins of the bronze drums which people and researchers are still trying to find today because there is kind of a, a fight between the different nation countries in that area who was the the one who had the, the bronze drums first and where did the bronze drums actually started to be produced because um, lots of, of a lot of research has been done on the techniques and it apparently is a quite advanced technique that uh, have been used by when producing the bronze drums so it means that you have to have a quite advanced technology which also means that you have a glorious past and, uh, and uh, which is uh, follows then that it's good to have this strong connection with the bronze drum. It gives you legitimacy and, and strong kind of identity um, today. 
uh, and that is quite outspoken in the different um, organizations and institutions that we have been working with, that this is kind of a, a, an important factor. So it ties into national uh, issues about national identities, political power, etc., uh, when talking about the bronze drums. We can't escape the fact that it is, it is actually a, a, a highly political issue, the bronze drum uh, research in this area. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we can move to um, the use and production of the bronze drums, um, how it is uh, illustrating a continuous, continuously changing tradition. I said that against uh, use and production of drum, bronze drums as a, uh, uh, a reinvented tradition when I bring up the example of, of uh, the Buddhist uh, production of bronze drums in Vietnam. But I just want to show this first, that, and as I said before, it is an, an um, ongoing tradition today where people produce, you see a picture to the right, uh, one of two bronze drum factories, authentic factories in China where they still produce bronze drums for the ethnic groups that are still using them for their rituals. Um, as you can see to the top, in the, at the top right, uh, the patterns have changed a bit from the ones that you are used to see in museums. Uh, there is no uh, feathered man, for example, no ships, etc. Uh, so they have kind of uh, changed the motives as well. Uh, the motives that is central here is um, a band of uh, um, that reminds of this of the sticks with this textile on, which you can see. It's not very clear, but uh, all of the drums that are produced for the current uh, users have that kind of, of uh, in this area, have that kind of pattern. Um, they use this not only for their own kind of uh, animistic uh, rituals, but also to attract tourism. And um, then they, they uh, perform it in one way, and then they go to the funeral the next day, and they perform it in a different way, and so on. Um, and they also make a distinction between the local and the national kind of uh, heritage because at the same time as these groups are using the bronze drums for their purposes, the, uh, there are also a lot of drums in the national museums in the capitals of these different countries. And there they present a quite different story uh, which relates them back to the historical uh, legitimacy of early production of the bronze drums. Um, <coughs> it is also the case that the producers and the users are not the same. Uh, it also goes back to all these creation stories that it was all never ever the same produce, the same group of people that produced the drums uh, as the ones who used them. Um, and that seems to be an, an um, continuous kind of uh, tradition too. Um, so they are then today in this area use for you, the drums are for use um, by the ethnic groups, but also as uh, Na kind of very strong and important national cultural heritage um, presented in museums. And not only in museums, but also in, in uh, private homes as status markers. Um, here you can see to the top right another kind of pattern uh, on a drum that is also produced very recently. And it has the animals of the uh, lunar calendar, the Chinese 
calendar year. Uh, so there, for the first time, you see a close connection to a Buddhist tradition from being kind of uh, the, the patterns that have been mo mostly connected to animist rituals and traditions. They have uh, now quite recently been uh, including also um, like Buddhist, more Buddhist, obviously Buddhist patterns. Uh, and we talk also about a lot of uh, illicit trade and drums that end up here in Europe, for example. And um, we, I also want to add here that most of these trade, traded drums actually stay in Southeast Asia. It's super common to, to also trade uh, bronze drums as status objects in within Southeast Asia. Dennis Byrne wrote an article about that a couple of, of years ago and uh, where he points at this hi uh, hidden kind of fact that we focus so much on all the bronze drums that are exported and collected by, by people in Europe, but actually it's, it's a booming trend also within Southeast Asia that people uh, buy them, collect them, trade them as status objects. Not so for private use in homes, as uh, nationalist national heritage in museums and by local people uh, in uh, rituals. Um, so now, if we move to this um, example of this originally animistic kind of uh, uh, artifacts or bronze drums. Uh, how they have been kind of reinvented within a Buddhist uh, culture, which is quite interesting. And then we have to go back to Dongson and to Tanhua. Tanhua is today is the province where Dongson is uh, located in uh, eastern Vietnam. And uh, one of the most important labels of that area is the different patterns that you find on the ancient bronze drums that are connected to animist traditions. You can see it, people have tattoos, on nice cool uh, bars uh, up to the left there, they have depictions of these uh, feather dressed men, they uh, are on top of entrances to different, muse not only museums but also to uh, other uh, institutions and even um, daycare, child, children daycare centers, etc. They are used for anything. And in the night time, when you when you walk along the streets in Tanhua City, you see the these patterns, uh, huge like lights covering the the different streets and lighting up the, the night. Uh, so it's really an important part of the local kind of identity there to be the place where the bronze drums were found. Um, uh, there is also a new law in Vietnam recently that private collectors can have uh, um, it's allowed to have private collections of antiquities mm, uh, openly in a more formal way than it was before. So here to the down left you see a, uh, a newly established private museum with huge collections of bronze drums. Um, and it's open to the public, but it doesn't have to, but this one is, which is good, I think. Um, and when in Tanhua, uh, you can also experience this reinvented tradition of casting and using bronze drums in a Buddhist context. Um, this is one of the uh, around 10 accredited um, bronze casters in the town. Uh, who is part of an association that with its main aim to uh, strengthen the local cultural heritage connected to the national heritage, which is the drum, and to uh, maintain the tradition of uh, 
uh, having this close connection to the bronze drum. So if you are a bronze drum caster, there are lots of bronze drum casters in this area and most of them produce bronze drums that they sell as souvenirs, small ones and big ones, to tourists and to other people, not only tourists, a lot of local people buy them too. But they have no meaning in themselves, so to say. But then there are, as I said, 10 uh, bronze casting workshops uh, that has been accredited by this, the director of this association, who he is the director together with one uh, famous Buddhist monk in this area. And together they have uh, established this system for accrediting uh, bronze casters. Um, and when they cast the bronze drums, they have to follow a strict uh, Buddhist ceremony before that, Usually the, both the, the director and the, the monk comes to the workshops to perform this ritual. Uh, and then the, the specific bronze drum that has been casted after this ceremony is then uh, given to the temple. And in the temple, over the last 10, 15 years, they have been developing a way to uh, perform Buddhist ceremonies in the temple by using the bronze drum and playing music and uh, accompanying the, the chants and so on. So it has become incorporated into the Buddhist ceremony in a way that is uh, quite new. So, uh, and also the fact that they have uh, developed uh, the patterns as I said before, to include uh, Buddhist um, patterns and symbols. These drum bronze drums that are made by these uh, group groups uh, have still exactly the same uh, patterns as the original ones uh, made 2,700 years ago with the feathered men and, and all this. So it's an intricate mix of everything here, which is quite interesting, I, I think. <coughs> this is also the case when you go to Myanmar, for example, in Kaya state. A lot of the Kaya uh, ethnic groups have been um, uh, adopting Christian beliefs. Uh, I think 50% of all the people in that area are Christian. And um, that, that is also interesting when coming to the Christian churches, to the cathedral in uh, Loiko, for example, which is the main city in Kaya State. Uh, they have also incorporated bronze drums in the Christian uh, religious practice and the ritual in the church. Um, but there they say it's more, that they are quite outspoken about it. it's a kind of a compromise because they know that the people that they want to draw, draw to the church are using the bronze drums and that's a way for them to kind of say that we accept your traditions if you come and be part of our tradition. Um, and you can also find it in, in other uh, areas, in both in, in Thailand and Laos and Vietnam, uh, this happens. But the most uh, striking example is this one in uh, Tan Hoa, since that is also the heart of the establishment of the Dongsong culture and so on. So these are the drums outside the temple, well in, in the temple actually, where they are um, used in uh, performances uh, as part of the Buddhist ceremony. And they are played by the director of the association together with the monk that have initiated this uh, thing. So, I'll just conclude here, I made it a little bit shorter because we started later. So, if we just start by doing a kind of flashback, the bronze drums that have been used and produced since, uh, well, almost 3,000 years, and uh, from being part of an animist ritual practice, the bronze drums are now incorporated into Buddhism and represent both its art production and its ritual practice. It is a complex picture, the world of the bronze drum. 
So in my analysis, I have a few things to depart from concerning religion and politics. So when it comes to religion, <coughs> it's always difficult to make right to everything here because I try to skim over very much in a very quick time. Um, but in general, I can say uh, when it comes to religion and religious practices that the ritual practice that is uh, performed in the whole of this area is a, an intricate mix of animism and Buddhism and also sometimes Hinduism and Christianity. So it's difficult to distinguish one from the other. And so it's difficult also to say that there was a pure animistic tradition that now is, has been incorporated in a pure Buddhist tradition. It's, it's very difficult to tell one from the other. Um, and we have also the, the political aspect of it, which I mentioned briefly before, the um, competition of who is the original owner of the bronze drum, so to say, which is still an ongoing kind of competition um, and shows the how heritage is really a strong component in contemporary politics in society today. Um, but to reach a better understanding and come up with some conclusions here, I have chosen to explore this um, example by borrowing the Chinese concept of shen, shen shai, uh, which means fake. And the Korean philosopher Han Byung Chul, uh, he has used this uh, concept uh, and analyzed it in relation to art and heritage. Um, because there is also a complex relationship between Western heritage discourse and Southeast Asian heritage practice. It is not that I, I believe in a discourse of difference, because I think some heritage people, academics, say that oh, we do it uh, like this here in the Western world, and they do it like that in, in, in Asia. But I, I am not sure I want to agree with that, since I think uh, we need to expand the world of Western heritage discourse by also truly and for real including uh, a wider um, heritage discourse that is represented and can be found in Asian contexts. Um, so going back to uh, Han Byung Chul and his um, way of going from using different concepts to come to a conclusion about copies and fake. We start with the concept of right, which in Chinese, I'm not at all good in Chinese, so I guess several of you are here are much better than me in Chinese, but the concept quan seems to be the concept for right. And if we look at it from, from a Western perspective, if we still talk about the Western or Asian, just so that we can talk about it. It's uh, the equivalent of, of truth. But looking at Quan from an Asian perspective, it's more a calibration to reach a balance, which means that there are so different perceptions of right and truth and balance. It's still the same concept, but it's we relate to it in so different ways, so, so very different ways. Uh, because if we believe in truth, uh, there can be an original when we talk about art history, for example, or a painting or whatever. Um, but to reach balance, on the other hand, as the, the concept means in an Asian context, uh, adaption to change is needed. And there is, and therefore, there can be no original. There can be no start and no end. It's a constant kind of, of uh, process with where change is accepted. So to, to remain true, the true being in the Western philosophy sense, uh, which is based on Plato's ideas about an original that is destroyed through change and reproduction. Uh, to remain true, permanence and resistance against changes is needed. Whereas in the Asian uh, perspective, 
its uh, change is accepted in a way. And these are, uh, this is quite of very, how can I say, um, structurally important for understanding preservation and, and originality and so on in uh, heritage uh, studies because it's two very different ways of looking at, at uh, the material that we are actually dealing with. Um, so in Asian perspective then, to copy is to praise in a way. When creating arts, for example, the artist studies, complements and admires the original by copying. When the copy is as good as the original, the artist has succeeded and is then considered a new original master in a way. So in line with this, it is also not only allowed but encouraged to add to an original. To make it even more original and to replace an original with a fake if the fake is better than the original. You follow? <laughs> um, if a fake maker creates a fake that is bet better than the original created by the master, the fake maker is the master. So who the artist is, is subordinate to the value of the piece of art, the copy or the original that has been changed. This is connected to the Asian ideology of process and continuous change that I mentioned just. Um, and this is distinguished by European philosophers in the 19th century as something essentially different to their ideology of being, um, as mentioned above, and of beginnings and ends. But, for example, Michelangelo was a fake-making genius in the 16th century. He practiced and painted perfect copies of borrowed pieces of art and then returned the copies. So this was, with other words, common uh, procedures, not only in Asia, but also in Europe at this time. But only until the 18th, 19th century, when the idea of the importance of the artist with a capital A was established alongside with the valuing of private collections. So in a sense, the fake or copy consumes the original, which is then being lost. So here in the case with the bronze drums, we need to consider what is lost and what is gained, I think, uh, of, of the heritage. Because today heritage is being created more rapidly than it is being lost. And the basic question here within my case study is then whether it is okay or not to change the bronze drum tradition in the way that I have just showed from being an animist tradition to a Buddhist tradition to a Christian tradition, change the motives, don't not care about the original kind of motives and uses. And as I started out, the adventure starts when trying to interpret knowledge from Southeast Asian context to something that, uh, that develops the academic field of art history, archaeology and heritage studies in Europe. So this is what I think is needed uh, to include uh, in our um, academic uh, contexts here in Europe might be scary, but perhaps uh, necessary to try and switch foundational structures and rethink some of these taken for granted concepts. So instead of the notion of original that is structurally closely connected to the notion of truth, where truth is a cultural strategy that with help of exclusion and transcendence work against change, we might think with the concept of balance which is a cultural strategy that relies on inclusion and immanence, where copies and reproductions and reinvented traditions can be related to in a more free and productive way. So, I think I leave it with that. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to have any comments on this? As I said before, it's, it's really difficult to try to ha, talk about a, such a wide scope, but mm -hmm. still I'm sure that you have lots of, of um, detailed knowledge about things that I might have gotten wrong or skipped over or 
passed it over, and yeah. Uh, I find it so interesting. Um, uh, you were talking about the, you know, the constantly changing condition and how the motifs and the rings could be altered, have been altered over time. And then you also mentioned in Tanghua the um, uh, there were two accredited uh, makers of the bronze drums. So, you know, what 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 are I mean, is that accreditation sounds? Is that something that where they were controlling uh, mm -hmm. what what could be changed in the making of the drum and the appearance of drums? Like a kind of certification process or kind of limiting? Mm -hmm. is, is that what that is, or is there some other factors that? Yeah, it had to do with uh, it had to do with um, Buddhist beliefs in this case because. Uh, there were actually ten uh, different uh, casters that were accredited among like hundred maybe that you can find in Tenghua province. And uh, so the monk and the director of the association for maintaining local heritage uh, accept uh, the bronze casters that are pious Buddhists and that are also um, performing rituals uh, when before they they cast bronze drums because as I showed before another photo from a, a factory a bronze drum factory in China there they also have they al always have a little shrine uh, in these factories so even if they're not part of a setting like this organized by a, a an organization, uh, they still perform these uh, rituals before they cast a bronze drum that is going to be sold to one of the ethnic groups that are going to use it in for their funerals and weddings and harvest ceremonies and so on. If they produce bronze drums for tourists or for mm -hmm. selling as souvenirs to ordinary people who are not using the bronze drums, then they don't do the, the, the ceremony. So these 10 uh, casters in Tenghua, they were um, um, they have been working with uh, trying to identify the right casters, uh, the monk and the uh, director of the organization for many years so that they, they, can, they have to show that they are actually doing these kind of ceremonies beforehand. And in this case, in Tenghua, the ceremonies are Buddhist in a combination with animist, whereas in the examples from China, the ceremonies before casting is purely animist. It would be interesting to know, I mean, are those similar to the rituals for making a Buddhist statue, for instance? Or something? Similar. similar. Mm. Wow. Very much so. Something Almost like identical, I would right, say. Okay, yeah. Say yeah. So that's the one of the prerequisites, so to say, for these casters to, and not only start with because they want to be accredited, but but uh, they have been, they must have been doing that since time immemorial. <laughs> mm. I have a question. How long ago in your research do you think they were? remaking them, as you were saying, these new copies or fakes, as you like to call them, from the originals. There must have been a gap when they weren't being made. When, when did this you know, reuse of these drums actually come about? 20, 30, 50 years ago? What are we looking at? Well, from the Myanmar perspective, there have been document documented, and also in China, a continuous production uh, since they were produced uh, during the Bronze Age. But so over the last 2,000 years, they've been producing them yes, since the Bronze Age? Yes, continuously, continuously. continuously. Mm -hmm. But this uh, re... how can I say? Because that, that's the, the whole problem mm -hmm. with the whole um, mm -hmm. case study, because it's not a gap, and it's not there they started to do copies. So this is the whole idea of doing this presentation, to show that there are no <laughs> such gaps. It's a continuous kind of tradition. And the people in uh, the Bai Kuyao people, for example, in Donglan province, in, in uh, Donglan district in Guangxi province in China, uh, they claim to be doing the rituals exactly as their ancestors did 3,000 years ago. And when you come to uh, 
people in northern Laos, the Kamul, they also claim that their ancestors, they, they do, the, do the rituals exactly in the same way as their ancestors did two or three thousand years ago. But of course they don't, because they change, and they change, they have been changing over the last hundred years, which has been documented. Yeah. And I have seen documentations from both Myanmar and uh, Laos and China, where there are uh, written sources, ethnographic material, how people are doing the uh, rituals, how they produce the drums. And of course, it's not exactly as they do it today. And it has, I guess, changed along. But the patterns, that's the biggest change, is this change to the Buddhist yeah, and but it's use. When did that really come in? But that started, well, that's just a couple of decades ago. That's yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the, the Buddhist, the, the Buddhist mm -hmm. pattern is introduced much, much yeah. later. Mm. Yeah. So that's not part of the, the drums from the, let's say, 500 years ago. Yeah. In the group of, of uh, drummers from the Bai Kuyao people that I showed you, the man with the sticks with the red textile, they showed me the drums because they had been in a funeral the, the day before. They came to do the performance in the museum. And they used drums that were made two years ago. 600 years ago, 1,200 years ago, and another one which was the oldest one in the village, which was more than 2,000 years old, I would guess. So they, for them, the age doesn't really yeah, matter, yeah. which is quite interesting, I think. Thank you. You say um, the producer and the user of drums is different mm -hmm. ethnic groups, right? Mm. And do you see any um, exchange meaning or form between uh, amongst these two groups, for example, in Burma? Because when they, when they explain the, the form mm. and, uh, and the creation of the drums in each group, they mm. might have different meaning. Mm. So in this uh, process of dealing, to mm. order the drum and produce a, produce a drum for the, mm. for the clients. Mm. Did, they have any process, did, you, did you see any process or changing of meaning that they try to? No, they are more or less ordered. Because in Burma, for example, it's traditionally uh, the last one or two centuries documented that it's the Shan who are the producers of the drums. And uh, the users are other ethnic groups and the other ethnic groups order the drums from the Shan, who are very good at uh, working with metal and doing, producing the drums. So in that case, the order is also, includes also the, the pattern, so to say. So I can't see, trace any exchange of uh, included pa uh, patterns included in the bronze drums in the in the Burmese example, uh, it's more difficult to uh, see this in the Chinese example uh, from uh, uh, Nandan and Donglan and that area because there it is not so obvious that there is another group or ethnic group that are the producers from the ones who use them. Sometimes it's the same. And there, of course, there are some um, influences from both ways. For in case that the VIP food food producer is a user of drums, too, they share meaning of the, the, the declaration or the meaning of the drum use. In the Kaya case, there are not so um, elaborated patterns as we have seen here from the Chinese and, and uh, Vietnamese example. It's uh, the traditional current drum, if you know how that looks. And that is more geo geometrical <coughs> uh, patterns. So. In that sense, it's not so easy either to to distinguish any influences from between producers and users. Uh, and uh, we also documented actually, uh, um, but that was not in Kaya State. That was in uh, Karen and the Karen area, 
where uh, one of the most important collectors in that area <coughs> was one of the Buddhist monks and he had both ancient drums and more recently produced drums that he also used now and then in the, within the Buddhist ceremonies. Uh, Can you tell us more about the museum as to who owns it and is it just the old ones and, and how do we define old? <laughs> Which as museum? The, the modern museum. You showed us the private museum. Yeah. As to who, what is in it. Oh, it? so... Other artifacts. Other, other artifacts. Bronzes. It's like three stories high, huge, and uh, primarily bronzes. But there are also more prehistoric artifacts, stone artifacts, uh, uh, a lot of different vari various uh, archaeological artifacts, but primarily bronzes. Is he a local? Then, yes, he's a local. Mm -hmm. He's a building entrepreneur, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he has been collecting bronze drums. There are so many private collectors in that area. And uh, he's uh, fortunate, so he has money enough to, to uh, <coughs> build this huge museum. Yeah. Mm. And they also buy the archaeologists, um, one of a few of the archaeologists that I was working together with, had friends that were on the same route as us, uh, buying <coughs> artifacts to collect uh, to their own, to be museums. Okay. It seems to be. Mm. When did it open? Uh, 2016. Okay. Mm. So I'm wondering about um, your picture on the left here. Mm -hmm. um, one way of thinking about that, and just in revisiting what you were saying in your conclusion there, one way of thinking about that is that she's, so this is a Buddhist context, the drum is being used in a very different way from your earlier example of mm. playing the drums within particular ceremonial contexts. Mm. So one way of thinking about it is, this is adopting the Western perspective of the original, right? The original is in a case, there's a museum style display, she's venerating the ancient thing in its original state. Mm. Um, but another way of taking that is that looks like a Buddha image, looks like a relic. Mm. Um, these things happen on altars in little display cases and mm. um, along with the other pseudo anthropomorphic yep. accessories there, yep. right? So it's more, where more does like this that. Fall I think it falls into in your, your second, uh, in the second one, second one right. because um, the fact that it is in a glass case is uh, that um, this is from southern Laos, yeah. and it was excavated uh, in connection to some mining activities, mm -hmm. because that's also quite common. All these bronze drums are found in areas where a lot of mining activities are going on, because yeah the soil is rich in metals, so they have been traditionally producing bronze drums there and they have kept them there and used them there and so on. And uh, this was a team of uh, foreign archaeologists who excavated together with people from the uh, Ministry of Information and Culture in Vientiane. So in that sense, the, the fact that there is a glass case is what you call the Western kind of style of exhibiting an object. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, on the other hand, that's the only thing really that uh, uh, reminds us of that. The, the whole uh, procedure around and how people come there uh, is more like the picture in the right on the right hand side, which is um, in an area quite close to this mining site where people found a bronze drum placed upside down in the riverbank uh, 15 years ago and uh, they were afraid of uh, excavating it because uh, they thought something bad would happen so they built a little shrine on top of the bronze drum they didn't report it to the local authority but the, the people at the local ministry of the local office of, uh, from the Ministry of Information and Culture knows about this, but that is also a person who is uh, a, a person who is practicing 
this combination of animism and Buddhism in that particular village. So his role in the village is uh, more important for him than to serve the Ministry of Information and Culture in Vientiane and send it, excavate it and send it to Vientiane to put in, a, in the National Museum. Mm -hmm. So they haven't really yeah. told that mm -hmm. to, the, mm -hmm. to the national authorities. So they keep it in the village, they uh, have built this shrine and they, they, mm -hmm. they perform their ceremonies continuously and sometimes they also take a piece of the bronze sprout to make a charm or a for s very very special occasions where when someone is really really sick or really really need to be helped <laughs> so I would say that it fits into your um, more into that kind of uh, procedure mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was interested in the in connection between bronze drums and gongs in South Asia. Mm. Um, because I mean, uh, you you were mentioning in the beginning of the presentation how from the Gobi Desert going like southward, the, the shape of these gongs like changed mm. to make it more resonant and became the the, the, gong, the, the bronze drums. Mm. Um, uh, it's funny how in I mean in ethnomusicology in general is uh, believed that the spreading of these gongs uh, started from the Tonkin uh, Gulf and went to all the, the way to Indonesia and mm. these drums these bronze drums became the actual Indonesian and Malaysian gongs mm. and so it's the it's reverse yeah, it's it's a reverse yeah. Process, yeah. process uh, so that's one thing um, mm. and the other thing is. Um, you said that this tradition has been continuous in in the last uh, thousand years, uh, but the same behaviors, ritual behaviors that you were mentioning to the bronze drums are also applied to the gongs and in Myanmar also to some special like wood drums. Mm. So I was wondering if I mean, do you think it's like mm -hmm. just parallel path that at a certain point, starting from bronze drums, let's say gong song, bronze drums just spread through. Uh, Southeast Asia and became you know, wood drums, for example, in Myanmar, or uh, gongs in, in, in Indonesia? Mm -hmm. or I and is it possible that this kind of reinvented be ritual behaviors, uh, either Buddhist or animist or whatever they are now, mm -hmm. are taken from the gongs? Mm -hmm. I mean, the behaviors that people, <coughs> the way that people behave to the gongs, mm -hmm. instead of the, to the like, instead of a like, direct line. Mm. Uh, in, in the bronze drums tradition. Mm. Well, talking about wooden drums, I think, for example, uh, on the borderland between Burma and Thailand, in the refugee camps, there were a lot of people from Kaya who fled over the border to Thailand. They, of course, didn't bring their bronze drums when they fled. So they are still in the ground somewhere in the jungle on the Burma side, mm -hmm. or sold or traded. And what they do there now is that they use wooden drums instead, instead of the bronze drums, because they still need to perform their kind of traditional rituals. So I think from a musicologist perspective, I think it doesn't really matter if it is a gong or a drum or a wooden drum or whatever. And as you say, as you suggest, uh, I mean the explanation that it was developed from a gong to a drum <laughs> when they moved south. It's part of the creation stories. There are no kind of scientific evidence okay. for that being so, of course. So, so it's part of the. Uh, it's just to present the different ways that people perceive of how the, dr the drums have developed. And I guess it's the same in your case. Uh, the source material for the hypothesis that there are actually drums that developed into gongs, mm -hmm. is that based on, on <coughs> what is that based on? Is it, uh, have they dated uh, the objects or what is that? I mean, could you explain 
Are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No. The, uh, well, I, I think it's, it's um, kind of contested now. Yeah. But um, origi the, the original idea, I think, was by Mantle Hood. Mm. So um, he was uh, like mm, one of the father of ethnomusicology, and mm. he proposed this theory according to which basically either like shipwrecking or trades from mm. from mainland Southeast Asia to mm. Indonesia make this like islanders mm, people like mm, knowing this 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 uh, bronze drums culture and they started to develop mm. uh, their own bronze drums mm. and Mantelu like kind of like describes that in a, in a very mm, novelistic way yeah. I would say in a book Mm. Which is nice to read, but mm. uh, I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the the, the archaeological no. evidences. <laughs> it is. It's kind of no. like beyond my exactly. my theory, yeah. honestly. Uh, but it, it it is a fact uh, that yeah. I mean bronze. I mean gong chimes yeah. are uh, an um, can I identify Southeast Asian mm. music. Yeah. You can find it in Myanmar and you Absolutely. find it in, in yeah. Vietnam and in, in Indonesia. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and there is definitely a connection with the, with the bronze drums because, uh, as yeah. you mentioned, some some minority groups still use the bronze mm. drums, mm. fake copy or not. It, mm. it is a bronze drum. Mm. So, uh, but the same behavior is also used to to, to the gongs. Mm. Exactly. But I think uh, it boils down to the fact that it is a piece of music, and that you, this music does something. Uh, at least according to the people that are using the drums in their ceremonies today and listening to <coughs> 93 bronze drums being played at during uh, the funeral there and there in that case with the Bai Koyao they have uh, a wooden basket mm -hmm. that so one person one man is is drumming uh, it is lying horizontal like this and the other one is taking this um, ah. wooden bucket in and out mm -hmm. to Change strengthen the and, and it's it's such a, a sound that it really affects you physically. Mm -hmm. So I think it doesn't really matter because I think that is what the, the main aim with doing these ceremonies is to <coughs> reach that kind of sound that affects you physically so that you can actually call the ancestors or what any of the different purposes there are with playing the bronze drums. And then if it is a gong or a drum or a wooden drum, it's the same kind of result. And I think that's the result that, that that's the main thing that people are after when they use it. Okay. At least for those who, who use the drums still today. And I guess it was the same case in prehistoric times and historic times too. Have there been any musicological study of the uh, methods of playing the drums and mm. the methods of playing gongs? Yes, it yeah. has. I am not uh, very knowledgeable about it, but I, I cooperate with a, mus a musicologist and also a composer and a musician. Mm. So mm. they have been doing studies um, mm. on this and there is a field of researchers mm. in doing work on that as well. Mm. Not so many, but there are mm. things written about it. Has there been any study of the etymology of, of terms for referring to drums or, and the you know, parts of drums among mm. all different groups? It seems that because the different groups that use the drums in the, this Zomia area today they are not uh, part of the same ethno-linguistic groups. They are Hmong Khmer speaking and they are Chinese speaking, Burmese speaking. So from a linguistic point of view, they are not kind of from the same root, to, so to say. But the terms for the drum is quite similar. Klong, Klu, and, and you can find it even if the different group uh, speak very different languages. Um, so there are uh, close words that are closely connected, but there is no study that I know of that has been carried out um, concerning specifically that concept, but 
it's just by talking to the different <laughs> people and hearing their kind of concept for the drum that uh, we see similarities. But I'm sure there must be some linguists doing research on that. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I just suggest some idea from my opinion. Mm? Yeah, I, uh, I just read some ethnology document, and in one of the we mentioned about um, the the items, trend item. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and the uh, condominas it is to mm -hmm. as Ethnologies in Vietnam during the colonial times, yeah. mm -hmm. and he wrote that the the ethnic group mm -hmm. they used the woven um, the the blanket mm -hmm. woven by their wife to exchange the the, tra uh, the, the, the item they what they want, mm -hmm. and I think that is in thi in this case, bronze drum was used as the dress. Yeah, to exchange mm -hmm. from this country to other country, from this co community to other community. So that's that's why there's most of the minority in the higher land. Mm -hmm. They use this bronze room and they not they they were not able to cast any bronze room. in they the mountains. You mean? Yes. But there are there are trace there are. Uh, evidence now that drums have been uh, casted also in the mountainous areas. Very little research has been done on that, but mm. there is at least two. There are at least two sites uh, in Laos that have recently been um, um, uh, interpreted as production sites. And one is in the mountainous area, close to where the minorities live, who use still use the bronze drums. But in case, in, in, in case of Vietnam, in case of Vietnam, only the the production sites have been identified so far in the lowland, which is also the central hub for the trade, of course, and there are. Ambra Kahlo, for example, she has uh, her book on the on the bronze drums. Uh, she has traced these trading routes and exchange networks and so on very well, I think. So, of course, uh, I think according to also the uh, fieldwork results from uh, the mountainous areas, we understand that uh, the drums have been traded also in prehistoric times, not only uh, the last kind of centuries, but that they always have been traded and used both for uh, ceremonial uh, ritual practices and also for uh, showing wealth and being part of, of the, uh, as for example in Vietnam, the Hmong. Uh, that's very obvious, uh, a strong connection to uh, having a bronze drum as a piece of a, a status object. So <coughs> Only the elite uh, did have bronze drums. So can we use this, your, your ideas, to explain the original copy of fake? No. That's, that's part of the point with it, that it's irrelevant for the producers and users today to distinguish between uh, original copy and fake because if they are used if they have if they are empowered uh, which they are if they are used in ceremonies sometimes people also see the bronze drum as uh, as a, a container for uh, an ancestor a spirit of an ancestor so they treat the bronze drum, they have it in the house, they give the bronze drum a name, they treat it as a, as a family member, and sometimes the bronze drums live their own life, they disappear in the nighttime and they come back in the morning and they, yeah, 
So there are lots of stories about how bronze drums also can be seen as like human beings because they are empowered. So if they are empowered, this thing with fake original copy is irrelevant. If it concerns trade and collection and exhibition in museums, then of course we can talk about uh, authenticity, originality, uh, fake and copy and so on. But that, that is what I think has come out from this, which was not the aim from the beginning of the project, that uh, this irrelevance of these concepts within a, in a context where they are used and produced still today. It's a, cons it's, a, it's a modern construction, this thing of originality and, and fake, contra fake, I think, in a way. Mm. Which makes me a bit uncomfortable because that was not the, the main aim from the beginning, to be uncomfortable like that. <laughs> we've, yeah. we've traveled around as have many others. Uh, you maintain that they're seen as the same, but when we've encountered them, there is no question that the older original, as a Western aesthetic might put it, the older original pieces are treated with much more respect because everybody in all the villages fully appreciates the financial value of them. Mm. So an older piece on a Western market might be worth $300,000, whereas mm. a brand new one, and you shared, showed some pretty awful brand new ones with the gold sort of yeah, finish. Yeah, yeah. They're mm. awful. They wouldn't get 30 bucks. No, no, no. no in a yeah. flea market. Yeah. So when you're there, they do tell the difference, mm. in, in my experience, mm. uh, between the, the, the original mm. and the, the contemporary mass produced. Mm. So I, my personal experience isn't quite reflecting your no. research. It, it's when you look at it from, uh, from an, if you have the perspective of a knowledge about uh, trade, um, of the drums. But in some areas, this is not the case. In quite many villages, they have never ever seen a, a Westerner before. And they're very rare. Yeah, but they are still... And they've got Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> no, they haven't. <laughs> uh, so, I would say that sometimes it's not even worth... I mean, in most cases, in Luangnamta, for example, in, in northern Laos, uh, there was a survey carried out 20 years ago, and then they documented uh, around 850 bronze drums in that quite small area. Today, I was part of the survey uh, two or three years ago. In that area, we did a re-survey the area. Went to the same villages, 85 bronze drums were still there. So it means... They're all in those modern museums that you 10%. showed. 10%, mm -hmm. yeah. Or traded to anyone so that they could buy a motorbike or a new mobile telephone or whatever. But still, there are examples. And of course, then they, they uh, uh, take into account the fact that the, the bronze drum is old. The older, the better, because it's more valuable money-wise. But in the villages where they still use, they are very cautious to, to sell all the bronze drums in the village. Even if they had like 10, 12 bronze drums in the village 20 years ago, and now they sell a few of them, but they, they can't sell everybody, uh, everyone of the, of the bronze drums. So they still have to have the bronze drums to be able to perform their, their um, ceremonies. And then it's not necessarily the oldest ones that are still being kept in the village because they don't need to be very old to be part of the ceremony. So that's my kind of point here, that for the ceremony, it's not the older the better. <laughs> we, we are run out of time. Somebody will oh. do this. Yes. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.